Yeah. 
that. I just want you to soak in his blessings. You know, as we were singing that song, that worship song, I could just, in my own mind's eye, see the Father in heaven pouring out a blessing on our lives. And I don't know about you, but I know I need the Father's blessing. And I think this morning, as you know, I was so blessed it was like a symphony in here this morning. Hearing all the voices blending together with one common goal and purpose that is lift up the name of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We do exalt you, King Jesus. We thank you for pouring out a blessing upon our lives, Lord, that we can just continue to look to you, Lord God, in these times of trials and tribulations, knowing that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That, Lord God, quote, in the good times and the bad times, you're always there. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Wow. Wow. What a, a great time of worship. I want to tell you thank you. I think you came prepared to get in the presence of Jesus today. I don't know if it's the turkey. Maybe we ought to feed you turkey every Saturday or maybe Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, okay? But uh, we are, <coughs> excuse me, so glad that you're here today. You know, I want to read you a letter here. Uh, I'm going to eliminate the name we wrote it, but, uh, you know, we, we like to help people here at church because, you know, I found out sometimes we need help. Sometimes we get to do the helping. You know, and so there's never should be, be any, what I, what I say, somebody should be ashamed if they need help. Sometimes we're just a little down on our luck, so to speak. But somebody, somebody we help somebody here, maybe, they, they're not even in our community anymore. Okay, but maybe we helped them maybe six months ago. I don't even remember when, okay? And it says, Pastor Jeff and Marilyn, before my husband got a job, he said he wanted to tie this first paycheck. So we, uh, we are so grateful and thankful he has a job and we can give to the church and ministry. We, we were and are so blessed by your generosity at the church and the care for us when times were hard. We'll never forget that. Hope you're both well. Thank you with love. And, you know, and, and they wrote a check. And, and I have to tell you, it was a, a pretty substantial check that people that don't even go to our uh, church anymore, and they were here just for a short time, but they just thanked for the generosity and what I tell you, why do I tell you that? Because it doesn't matter what you do, how little it may seem, it touches somebody's life. Amen. You know, we live in a culture where it seems like people don't, they don't think people care anymore. But if you and I would just continue just to, we can't help the world, 
I realize that. But we can help the people that God brings into our world. And I think if we'll do that, God will continue to bless us. Amen. I want to also encourage you tonight. We have our, our Christmas sing-along starting at 6.30 to 7.30. If you can't make it here, the church, it's going to be live on Facebook Live. Those watching, you know, at, from uh, 6.30 to 7.30 Central Time. So you can watch that there, okay? Uh, also, uh, we want to keep in our prayers from a lot of, you know, Husker Bob. Uh, Husker Bob's not doing very well at all. He's in the hospital. Uh, uh, he's on a ventilator, okay? And so just keep his whole family in your prayers that way. And, and also Richard's son, uh, Christopher, his wife's family. Keep them in your prayers in, in Yankton. Uh, within the last week, uh, his, his uh, wife lost her grandpa and her dad, okay, in the last week, okay? And so, you know, keep that in your prayers, okay? And, and, you know, and make sure, if you haven't got it already, get your devotional this week. We start off uh, on Tuesday with a new month and a new devotional. And, and, you know, and I would just tell you this, you know, as far as with our COVID things and all this and that, I, I would, this is what I used to always tell all my teams when I coached. When you face an opponent, always respect your opponent, but never fear them. And, you know, and with COVID, you know, I, you know some people might think it's, it's really not real. Well, if it's not real, I got to tell you, there's a lot of people dying for something that's not real, okay? But it doesn't mean we have to fear it, okay? But just respect it and just make sure that, you know, you do what you can do and I can do what I can do to help people around us. Because you know what? I want to enjoy people as long as I can. You know that? And I want them to be able to enjoy. And so, you know, some people maybe if they come to church, they want to they wanna wear a mask. We're all for that, okay? I don't want anybody to think that, that we would think less of anybody if they wore a mask or if they didn't wear a mask, okay? We just want you to know that, you know, we're for you in your, in your journey and your faith, okay? And so we're really excited about that. What I want us to do, those watching via the internet, get your kids, those around here, you're ready to lay your hands, you're about ready to lay your hands on your kids, aren't you? Hallelujah. You've had them for an extra four days, okay? So uh, I, we'll really pray for our kids, okay, this morning, okay? Gracious God. And Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day you've given us. Lord, thank you for such a, a sweet time of worship this morning, Lord God. And as your presence was here, Lord God, and, and we just pray that that presence went also with the people watching via the Internet, Lord. And, and now we pray for our children, Lord, because we know our children are heritage of the Lord. We know, Lord God, uh, apart from our relationship with Jesus and our spouse, our kids are most important. And we know the enemy would try to come in and steal, kill, and destroy but we just surround them, Lord God, with prayers. We put, Lord God, a, a hedge of protection around them, Lord God. And we just ask, Lord God, that they will just make good and godly decisions this week. We ask, Lord God, you continue to protect them from any disease and infirmity, Lord God. At school or on the, on the courts, Lord God, where they're practicing, we just pray that your, your blessings will be upon their lives. And Lord, I pray for the people here, Lord God, continue to keep us healthy and whole. In the name of Jesus, be with us. Uh, be with uh, Chris Doma, Lord God, and his uh, wife's family, Lord God, and let your Holy Spirit continue to, uh, to, to comfort this family in this time of loss, Lord, and, and anyone else that has suffered loss, Lord God, this season. And, and we pray for Husker Bob, Lord God, and anyone else that, that needs a miracle, Lord. We just ask for a miracle for these people, Lord God, and let them reach out to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I'm also grateful that this is the beginning of the Advent season, Lord. And we're excited. Advent is talking about preparing the way of the Lord for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And may this Advent season, may this Christmas season be special to each and every one of us, Lord. And Father, and I thank and I praise you last for the people that have been so faithful in bringing their tithes and their gifts, their offerings in this storehouse, Lord God, that you would just continue to open the windows of heaven upon their lives. I thank you, Lord God, for meeting all their needs according to your riches and glory, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Well, thank you. You know, we're going to dismiss the kids to go downstairs, okay? And we're going to finish up with Nehemiah so the kids can go downstairs. And we're thankful for our teachers, okay, that have gone down and, and really, and I, and I hope you'll get to tell the teachers, and I know Chris is the one in charge of, of with, the, with the older kids that you tell her. She always has a great uh, little, uh, uh, what would I say, service down there and just and has something to make them something really na nice down there a little uh, to uh not toy but just uh what what am i trying to say craft. craft there you go see i don't like hobby lobby okay and that's crafts okay so i i try to keep that word out of my 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 vocabulary okay but it's a craft down there okay well i want you please to turn your bibles over to nehemiah chapter 11 <clears throat> 
Nehemiah chapter 11. And this is, the, we're, this is the final week on Nehemiah, okay? So we're talking about Nehemiah's final chapter in his life. And I want to remind us this. It's always important how we start in life, but it's imperative that we finish strong, okay? You know, people, they don't always remember how you start in life, but they remember how you finish in life. We're going to see Nehemiah, he started good, but more importantly, he finished good, okay? Good intentions are a great way to start, but a plan, <clears throat> discipline, and courage are required to finish on schedule. Have, you know what? We're coming up in about a month. It's called a New Year's resolution. Man, a lot of good intentions. What, what is going to be most of ours? We're going to lose a little weight maybe, you know? You know, I remember, remember when you were in high school or college, you got the freshman 15, now we got the COVID 15, you know, and all that. You know, and so, but there's going to be all these good intentions, but good intentions are a great place to start. But then we need a plan, and we need a schedule, and we need discipline, okay? Nehemiah wasn't a man that just talked about what he was going to do. He planned on how he was going to achieve his God-ordained goals and tasks in life. If you and I are going to succeed in our lives, in our jobs, with our spouse, with our family, with our church, it starts, number one, with a purpose. Everybody say a purpose. Then it's fueled with passion. Say passion. And then it's completed with participation. Say that. Participation. So we have purpose, passion, and participation. Those are things that we need in our lives if we're going to go from good intentions to completing what God has for us to do. And now we're going to go over in Nehemiah chapter 11. We're going to read the first two verses here. <clears throat> and we're going to skip a lot in Nehemiah because I'm not going to read through all the names and all the guys. Okay, but it says, Now the leaders of the people dwelled at Jerusalem, the rest of the people cast lots to bring out, uh, bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem. The holy city and nine tenths were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offer themselves to dwell in Jerusalem. Now, I think it's interesting here. You know what? What do we do know? We found out that really a tenth belongs to God, doesn't it? Don't you think it's interesting? When we talk about tenth sometimes, what do we think we're always just talking about? Money. Isn't that amazing? What, how, did they, how did Nehemiah pull, uh, start to fill up Jerusalem? He said, I'm going to take a tenth of the people. See, God was saying, I want that 10% to start filling up. And isn't it amazing? And it says the other 90%, what they do? They blessed them. Okay? And so we're finding out here that, see, God, when we talk about a tithe, God really wants our time. Do you understand? He wants our talents. He doesn't just, he's not just interested in yours and my finances. He wants a tenth of our lives, okay? See, giving to God isn't always easy, though. It isn't, okay? And many times when you and I give to God, it can hurt at that moment financially. But what I have found in my over 40 years of ministry and trusting Jesus is this. My father-in-law told me this. Jeffy, he used to call me. He said, Jeffy, what you give to Jesus, Jesus receives. What Jesus receives, Jesus blesses. And what Jesus blesses, Jesus gives back to you. And you know what? I thought, well, that's pretty good because over in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use or you give, it will be measured back to you. So what is God really telling us here? We have an important part in this, in this giving, don't we? In this blessing. What is going to come into our lives? We have an important part because it says, however we give will be given back to us. And so I'm excited about that. See, I'm not, my future is just not up to maybe, maybe not. See, I'm not just trying to hang on. I'm not some victim. God says, Jeff, you can play a vital role in your future by how you're giving, not just financially. Come on now. You know, and I have here next, we shouldn't limit God's blessings to money. Come on. See, too many people do that. You ask them, are they blessed? And the first thing they want to do is look at their pocketbook. I tell you what, folks, I have met some people that are blessed beyond measure and they don't have two quarters to rub. Do you understand? I think, and I've talked to you before about this. I think a marriage, you know what? Marilyn and I have been blessed 
You know what I think is a blessing is when your older kids call you up and don't want anything, hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? That's a blessing, hallelujah. It's, you know, I think it's a blessing that I can be married for 42 years. I think it's a blessing that Meryl and I have been blessed with wonderful health. Do you understand all these things? See, I'm not going to try to limit my blessings to a pocketbook. And we don't do God justice if we do. That's just one of the many ways. See, we need to allow the Lord to bless our entire life and not just a portion of our life. Doesn't the Bible say, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his life? You know, we just need to realize that what? God wants to bless our lives. Amen? See, for the people to move from the country to Jerusalem, they exchange riches for poverty. A comfortable house for a half-ruined one. From being a small landowner to now a hired hand. That's what the people did that moved from the country to Jerusalem. Okay, and it tells us in verse 2 that what? And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves, who volunteered. See, a large part of the work done in the community and the church is done by what? By volunteer help. You know what? If it wasn't for volunteers, we could not do what we do in life. And it tells us here that what? Not everybody had to cast lots to go to Jerusalem. Some people said, you know what? I'll give up what I have to go into God's house, into God's city. And, we, and you know what? Every week, people are volunteering their time to say, we're going to make it better in God's house, in God's city. And I appreciate that. You know what? Well, why would these people give up land, social status, and money? For one reason, and one reason only. Because they loved the house of God. That's the only reason. Why would people do this? Because they loved the house and the city of God. You know, it's amazing life. Some people, don't think some of the 90% that didn't go, they thought, man, you guys are nuts. Why would you give up your city? Why would you give up your nice house to go, and go to a ruined city? Why would you give up being a landowner to work for somebody? You know why? Because I love Jesus. I love the house of God. You know, isn't it crazy? Love will make you do a lot of crazy things. Remember what, what happened to Jacob, or, uh, uh, Isaac and Jacob, what, they, uh, Leah, and Rachel, okay? He worked for 14 years for his wife. That's love, hallelujah, okay? You know what I'm saying? And we need to realize that what we will do things if we love something or somebody, okay? It's kind of amazing because over in Isaiah 119, it says, if you and I are willing and obedient, the Bible says, we'll eat the good of the land. Why would somebody be willing to give up what God, what their land and their house? Because they said, you know what? I'll go and do this because I love God. And because when I serve God, you know what happens? The blessings of God pour out on our lives. The blessings of God pour out our lives. In repopulating Jerusalem, we see that God's house and God's city was of first importance. And thus, Nehemiah arranged a plan that Jerusalem would be well supplied with those who wanted to worship in her courts and those who wanted to guard her walls. See, they had done all this work. Ezra had come by and he started rebuilding the temple. Then Nehemiah came by and started rebuilding the walls. And he said, but now the job's not done. Now we've got to repopulate. Now we've got to put guards there. Now we need to hear worshipers. You know, folks, what good would it be if you had a building and there was no praise and worship? Then it's just another building. Amen? And you know what? Now, in Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 3, and we're going to go down to Nehemiah 12, Verse 26, we're not going to read those, okay? These are the names of everyone involved in returning Jerusalem to relevancy in the region. We're not going to read all their names, okay? And you know what? Because these are the ones that help bring Jerusalem to relevancy. Remember before Nehemiah and Esther came, Jerusalem was just a burned out city in the Middle East, okay? But now they brought it back to relevancy. See, for us as a church, to stay relevant in the greater Ponca area, you know what it's going to do? It's going to take all of us working together like they did here in, in uh, Nehemiah. Uh, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, it says here, There are difference of ministries, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. And then if you go down a little bit more in, in, in chapter 12, in verses 12 and 14, it says, For as the body is one, 
and as many members, but all the members that are one body, being many, are one body, so also in Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave, neither slaves nor free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So what's he saying? We're all different. I look around at you guys. You are as different as the day is long. I don't look. There are no identical twins here today. Hallelujah. You know that? There's not even a lot of people remotely close. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. God says, you know what? We're all different because that's how he made us. And you know what? As long as we appreciate somebody else's differences instead of trying to make them conform to what we are god says you know what then we can be relevant in our greater ponca area and verse 27 there in in nehemiah 12 i love this now at the dedication of the wall so here they're getting ready to dedicate the wall around jerusalem now at the dedication of the wall of jerusalem they sought out the levites and their in their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing, with cymbals and string instruments and harps. You know what? We need to make sure God's house looks like a celebration and not a funeral procession. It says here, man, they got the singers out. They got the musicians out. We're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate. My father-in-law, he used to tell me, he said, the, the problem, Jeff, with most church music, it has a mortuary swing to it. You know what I'm talking about. You know, the mortuary swing. It, you don't, no, I tell you what, it's time to celebrate. Yeah. No, I realize in life, Scott Frost may not want you clapping. Okay, hallelujah. But God says it's okay to clap in God's house. Hallelujah. It's okay to, get to, to celebrate. It's okay to, to get excited about God's house. Because you know what? God is doing something wonderful in our lives. Amen? And we need to make sure we realize that. Okay, now let's skip down into verse 28. It says, And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around, around Jerusalem in the villages of uh, wherever. Okay, and from the house of Gilgal and from the fields of Geba and Azareth. From the singers, they built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. Look at that. It says that what? The singers, they gathered and they said, you know what? We're going to build villages around Jerusalem. See, if we are we praisers or complainers? Are we worshipers or whiners? Okay? You know, people will notice what neighborhood you live in. It says that they, the worshipers lived in the neighborhood around Jerusalem. People will know what neighborhood you live in. Okay? I hope people notice that we live in the neighborhood of the city of David. It doesn't mean our lives are easy. Do you think it was easy for these people? No, we've read. We're at the tail end of Nehemiah. We know it hasn't been easy, but they said, you know what? We're not going to complain. We're going to praise. We're not going to whine. We're going to worship. You know what? See, people are looking to see what neighborhood do you live in? I don't want to go live in a neighborhood where all they're doing is whining and complaining. Do you? Come on. I want to live and I want to be in a neighborhood where people are praising God. I want to be in a neighborhood where people are worshiping God. Not because their lives are so easy, but they're focusing on who he is and not what's happening to me. Because you know what? Someday it's all going to change in life. You know that? Maybe you and I are going through a tough time in life. Maybe we suffered some loss financially, personally, life, life. We've done that. I'm never discounting those things in life. But I'm saying, you know what? I choose to put my eyes to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I choose to say, you know what? I'm not going to whine about this. Have you ever hated to ask somebody how they're doing because you know they're going to tell you? There are some people that, no, you won't ask them. How are you doing? And you're just expecting, a, no, they'll tell you everything. You know what? I got news for you. Do you want to hear about my aches and pains? Come on. Oh, no, you don't want to hear about I'm not saying you can't share them for prayer. But you know what? After 10 minutes, it's more than just sharing. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? And God's saying, you know what? Be a worshiper. Be a worshiper. Don't be a whiner. Be a praiser. Don't be a complainer. 
You know, because I found out those worshipers and those praisers, their, life ha- their lives have so many things going on, but they just choose to focus on Jesus. Amen. Verse 31, it says, So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand to the wall towards the refuge gate. So here we got Nehemiah says, you know what, we're going to get a couple of choirs together, okay? And in verse 38, it says, in the other Thanksgiving choir, hey, a Thanksgiving choir, hallelujah. Maybe that's what some people need in their lives, okay? And the other Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way. I was behind them with half the people on the wall going past the tower, the ovens, as far as the broad wall, okay? Here we see in verses 31 and 38, two choirs going in the dire- a different direction, but ending up at the same point. Ezra was leading one choir. Nehemiah was leading the other choir. These two choirs were not competing against each other. They were completing each other. I think it's interesting. Where were they at, the, the choirs? They were on the walls. Okay, now, for you that have been with us our whole journey in Nehemiah, it's kind of interesting. So here we have two choirs marched in the opposite direction on the walls of, of Jerusalem, okay? Now, do you remember the same walls when they first started building? Tobiah the Ammonite said foxes could knock down these walls. Come on. You remember, he said, don't worry about it. That fox, these walls are so flimsy, even foxes could knock them down. You know what I find out about this, folks? You know what? The things that the world says will never last become our foundation of praise. Amen. Can you imagine old uh, uh, Tobiah when he sees it? Here he's telling everybody, don't worry about these Jews. These walls will never hold nothing. And now all of a sudden they see two choirs marching around singing praise to Jesus, praise to God, to Yahweh. See, I don't care what the world tells you is trash in your life. If you'll turn it to Jesus, he can turn your trash into praise. Okay? And never, never forget that. Okay? Over in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, it says, This is the stone that was rejected by by the builders, which has become the chief corner stone. You know, it's amazing. I was thinking about this the other day. God is really, was the first guy that believed in recycling. He's taken all of our lives. You know that? They were junk, and he just recycles. And he turns us from a sinner to a saint, okay? He turns us from someone that was bound for hell to going to heaven. God is in the recycling business, okay? Hallelujah. And here we see that Jesus was the, was the stone that was turned away has now become the chief cornerstone for God to build his kingdom. So what I'm saying is when you and I come into disappointments in life, don't take that as a permanent answer. Say, you know what? I'm going to turn this disappointment into a praise. Because you know what? The world's looking. The world's looking around. And they're going to be flabbergasted by what happens in your life. What I found out, too, folks, with these two choirs singing, maturity can be measured many times and how much a person completes another person and not competing with another person. You know, it's really amazing in life. You can tell immature people because they're in a contest with everybody. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing, as, you know, and I, that's why I really do like sports a lot, too, is you watch, you know, I mean, I don't care if it's football or basketball or whatever. You, you know, in football, there's 11 on offense, 11 on defense. In basketball, five on the court. And you know those other guys on the bench want to play just as well. Come on. But the really good teammates are the ones they're celebrating with their teammates, even though they're not on the field. You know, I, I thought yesterday, or the other day when I was watching Nebraska play, that Mr. Miller, the kid that had that compressed uh, spinal cord that didn't get to play, and there he was on the sidelines cheering on his teammates. And, you know, see, he, he wasn't sitting there thinking, I can't play, so I'm not going to help my teammates. He was there cheering them on. See, that's a mark of maturity. Just because I can't do it myself doesn't mean I'm not going to be supportive. And, you know, we find out here, folks, in our spiritual walk, what happens when somebody here at church starts succeeding and it seems like you're left out? You know what the Bible says? We should be happy for them. That's a mark of maturity. 
And you know what? It's not easy when you're believing God for something and somebody else gets it. Has that ever happened to you before? It's happened to me before. Believe in God for something and somebody else gets it and you've got to be happy for him? Are you kidding me? I do remember the time Marilyn and I were in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Man, we had a 63 Ford Fairlane. Man, that thing. Thank God I got Marilyn when I was driving the 67 convertible Mustang, okay? Because the 63 Ford Fairlane wasn't the chick mobile, okay? I got news for you, okay? That was the marriage mobile. Do you understand? I borrowed my mom's convertible to get her to say I do. Then afterwards, then I drove the 63 Ford Fairlane, okay? And it was not a pretty car, okay? And, but I can remember, so we're, there we are down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We need a new car. All these things. Marilyn and I are believing God for a new car. I'll never forget it in my life. And somebody in church got up and said, I want to thank Jesus that God gave me a new car. And in my heart, I thought, doggone it, they stole my car. <laughs> now, it's hilarious when it happens to me, isn't it? I, know, I realize that in life, okay. But you know what? I had to decide right then and there. Jeff Peters, were you going to be happy for them? Because you know what? They were believing God, obviously, for a car too. And then I had to say, you know what? My God has more than one car. And you know what? My God will continue to supply my needs. But see, God was checking my heart out for maturity. Are you going to be happy for somebody else when they get what you're believing for? Because see, a mark of maturity says you will. And you know what? So you see these different singers, these two uh, Thanksgiving choirs, they weren't competing with each other. They were completing each other. And as they were marching around the walls and they were lifting up the praises of God, you know what they were doing? They were setting up an angelic host of angels around there. Hallelujah. And we need to realize that, that we need to be for people when things are happening for them. In fact, the scripture says, be happy with those that rejoice and be sad with those that are not rejoicing. Amen. And that's a mark of maturity. Okay. And verse 43 there in Nehemiah 12, it says, also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. And the women and the children also rejoiced. So that the joy, I love this man. This was not some quiet church mouse. And that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. Some people say, are you, why do you always yell all the time? You know, are you angry or something like that? No, I just get excited. Hallelujah. You know, God, I tell you what, our neighborhood should hear the praises of God. Hallelujah. They should hear us lifting up our voices and glorifying the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm just not that way. Were you that way Friday watching the Huskers? I'd like to have a little fly in your house. You might have been hollering and screaming. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, you know what? If we're going to holler and scream for them, we should holler and scream for Jesus. Come on. You know, Meryl and I, we had a lady in our church in, in uh, Flora, Indiana, Joanne Seagrave. Joanne was in her late 70s, early 80s, and it was so amazing. And when we'd have worship services, and if she kind of thought, she was kind of the patriarch of the, uh, the matriarch of the church, and if she didn't think people were doing what they did, there was Joanne in her 80s. She would get up and she'd say, come on, saints. She says, I used to go to church and they never talked about Jesus. And all, when, then they started Jubilee Fellowship, and she said, when Jesus saved me, he saved me. She says, I want you to follow me. And she would get up and do the cheer. Give me a J. She'd make everybody say J. Give me an E. E. S. S. U. U. S. S. Jesus. And she'd make us cheer. Now what's wrong with that? You do it at games. You do it with games. See, they, when they started worshiping Jesus, they heard from afar off the joy of the Lord. Amen. I think it's interesting here in verse 43, it also mentions, it says everyone was involved, and it's one of the few times, one of the few times in the Old Testament, children are mentioned. One of the few times. You know what we need to make sure we do as parents? You heard this before, there are no grandchildren in God's kingdom. Kids, you don't get to go to heaven because your mom and dad are good. You go to heaven because you made Jesus the Lord of your life. See, you, you don't slide in on somebody's shirt tail. You got to come in yourself. And we're finding out here the kids, the kids have lived, had lived in this oppression as grown up. And all of a sudden the kids started rejoicing. I know sometimes kids think, oh, that's for old people. You know, or that's for certain people. That's, for, that's not for me. Yeah, it's for all of us. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
Because see, God's word has come into all of our life. He's blessing our lives, and we need to make sure oh, we tell our children, you know what? You need to be able to lift up your hands and say thank you, Jesus, too. You need to be able to do for what God is doing in your life. It's just not a mommy and a daddy religion. Amen. It's a family Amen. faith. Very important, okay? You know, we're going to skip down to verse, uh, chapter 13. And chapter 13, we come to the end of Nehemiah's story. As we learn, and we learn the lesson that after great victories, many times great tests arrive, okay? As you and I are celebrating our victories, you know what the devil's going to try to do? He's going to try to come in and steal and kill and destroy. Verse 1, it says, On that day they read the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in that they found written that no Ammonite nor Moabite should ever come to the assembly of God. Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread <clears throat> and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. <clears throat> now, verse 4 is kind of interesting. Now, before this, Eliashib, the, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of God, was allied with Tobiah. Remember who Tobiah was? Now, uh, when I say Tobiah, everybody say boo. Tobiah. Boo. Yeah, see, he was not the good guy. Tobiah was the one that said, you know what, even when they build the walls of Fox, isn't it amazing in life, what's supposed to be in the storehouse? According to the Bible. God's tithe. Bring your all the tithes into the storehouse. What was in the storehouse? The enemy of God. Now, something's wrong in church when all of a sudden we're not bringing God's tithe in, but we're letting the enemy of God stay there. Come on. Isn't it amazing what we get from Nehemiah? You're thinking, man, how's pastor get all that stuff out of Nehemiah? It's really simple. It's all in black and white. Hallelujah. You know that? See, it generally isn't outside circumstances, our enemies, that cause the church, marriages, families, businesses, and friendships to fail. You know what it is? It's corruption from the inside. See, I'm not worried about what President-elect Joseph Biden our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. I'm not worried what they can do to Christ the King. I'm not. I'm concerned what each one of us can do to Christ the King. Okay? Biden, Pelosi, I'm not worried about them. I don't think they're walking through them doors. Okay, you know what I'm saying? If they do, I'll treat them with respect and try to get them saved. Hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, I'm concerned, what will you and I do with each other in the church? That's what's going to matter more than anything. See, if we obey God's word and the world falls apart, you know what God said? He said, I've given you a promise. I'm going to take care of you. Amen. See, if we obey God's word and the world falls apart, God said, you know what? I got you. Yep. I got you. So you know what? Let's not, you know, so many people want to make it all about the outside. No, it's really on the inside. What's been happening into our country, folks? Has it been some foreign invasion necessarily that's been tearing our country apart? No, it's been on the inside, hasn't it? See, I'm not so much concerned about the outside. I want to know what's happening on the inside of us. Look what it says in verse 6. But, but during all this, I was not in Jerusalem. See, Nehemiah had gone back to Persia. He says, uh, there in the 20, uh, 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. It's kind of interesting. So Nehemiah, he gets everything set up, and he says, you know what, I got some business. I got to go back to Artaxerxes. So he goes back, and when he goes back, all of a sudden, they let the junk back in. See, look what happened when Nehemiah went back to Babylon. See, what do we do when God, with God's word when no one is looking you know, it's so amazing to get on these Israelites, those rotten Israelites. But really, we're not any better than them. What are we doing when no one is looking with God's word? See, they thought, Nehemiah is not here. We can do what we want. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? God is always looking. In fact, it's kind of in the book of Proverbs, it says that, that the Lord sees everybody that's naughty and nice. I tell people, it's not Santa that sees it. Okay, it's the Lord, hallelujah. I'm sorry, kids. Okay, hallelujah. Okay, in verse 6, so we need to realize that. Now let's keep going down. It says, And I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil of Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. 
Can you imagine this? <laughs> He's preparing. Tobiah didn't want the people to be free. And now the high priest kid says, come on into church. I'm going to get you the office, the best office in the church building. Because Nehemiah had left. He says then, he says, and, and it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw, I love Nehemiah. He says, I threw out all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. You know, don't you know the meek shall inherit the earth? <clears throat> well, I tell you what, when you start messing with God's house, didn't Jesus do some things at God's house too? And see, we need to make sure that we keep God's house holy. Okay, very important. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back to them the articles of the house of God and the grain offerings and the frankincense. And I realized that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to the fields. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? Remember, why were they in this situation in the first place? They forgot to take care of God's house. And as soon as Nehemiah left, what happened? They went right back to doing that, okay? So I contended with them and said, why is God's house forsaken? I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithes of the grain and the new wine, the oil in the storehouse. And I appointed a, a, as treasury over the storehouse, uh, Shimeah, the, the, the priest of Zodak, the scribe, and the Levites. And it says, uh, for they, considered, they were considered faithful in their task, was distributing to their brethren. See, didn't they promise back at the beginning of the book that they were going to take care of God's house? <laughs> didn't they promise to do that? You know what happens, folks? Disobeying God's word in my life Disobeying God's word in your life gets us in trouble. <clears throat> Come on. Look, it says, in those days, in verse 15, in those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the... Wait, didn't Nehemiah just tell them? Come on, are you, are you tracking with me? Remember he said, hey, boys and girls, keep the Sabbath holy. He said, no more selling, no more buying on the Sabbath. They said, okay, Nehemiah. Now look what's happened. They reverted right back. Folks, isn't there pressure on us to do the same thing? Come on. I mean, haven't you and I made decisions like we said, we're going to do this, and we mean well. Come on. But then the pressures of the world of outside start coming and saying, well, you got to do this. you got to do that. And before we know it, we're right back on the treadmill with the hamster wheel. And you know what? It's not that people are bad. They just allow pressure to come into their lives. It says, it says, on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, uh, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provision. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is that we do that you have profaned the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do this, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm not always the quickest learner. You know, I used to always tell people this. You were smart if you learned from your own mistakes. I used to say, you know what, you're smart if you... Then the Lord showed me, he said, no, Jeff, any dummy can learn from their own mistakes. You're smart if you learn from somebody else's mistakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if I don't have to run my, if I don't have to run that nail through my hand and I watch Tom do it and I learn, that's not to do. I'm smart. Any dummy, when I run the nail through my hand, I know that hurts. Okay, hallelujah. And here Nehemiah tells the children of Israel, isn't this what got your forefathers in trouble? Isn't this what got us where we are today? And we need to guard our hearts, for out of it flows the issues of life. See, disobeying God's word not only creates more problems for ourselves, it creates more problems for the people around us. And you know what I find out in life? When I disobey God's word, you know what I'm really doing? This is what I know I'm doing in my own life. I'm stealing from my future and my life. When I'm disobeying God's word, I'm stealing from my own future and my own life. And you know what? That's what, Am I perfect? Heavens, no. I just spent three days with my wife. Okay, hallelujah. I know that, okay? 
But the fact of the matter is we need to make sure that we're doing the very best to our abilities, okay? And then, and then, uh, then he posts some guards, okay, and says it's not going to happen anymore, okay? And then I want us to go down to verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him even to sin. Now, it's not talking about women are sinful, okay? It's not. I will tell you this. I think a woman has a great part in helping a man become who he is in life, too. But what it's really telling us here is Solomon loved God. And loving God is not a guarantee you and I won't sin. I'm going to say, loving God isn't a guarantee that you and I won't sin. We must cast down every lofty imagination that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Then that I might, everybody say might. might. It didn't say I won't said that I might not sin against thee. See, just because we love Jesus doesn't mean we're going to live a perfect life. In fact, the Bible says if you and I hide God's word in our heart, we still might sin. But what is if you and I aren't going to hide God's word in our heart? Then, folks, we're going to sin. And so we need to make sure we put God's word in our heart. Because like Nehemiah, like the children of Israel, when Nehemiah went back to, to Babylon, all these pressures started coming in saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you should do this, you should do that. And yet we need to make sure, no, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my way. We need to, I don't know about you, do you ever have to talk to yourself? I do. I do. Sometimes when I'm going through a tough time, does your mind want to wander? Mine does. And sometimes i got to tell my mind. You know what? David said this. He said, soul, why so downcast, O oh, thy soul? Put thy hope in God. Sometimes i got to tell my soul, my mind. You know what, Jeff? Shape up. Hallelujah. What, you know, thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto i got to tell myself that because sometimes my pathway gets going a little crooked. Thank God I'm preaching to myself today. Okay, hallelujah. Okay. And I, gotta, I have to do that for me. Because all these things are constantly bombarding on me. But I know this, it's a spiritual battle. And I know if I obey God, the blessings of God come. If I don't obey God, I'm stealing from my future and my kids' future. I don't, you know what, folks? Doesn't that sound so easy to obey God? I mean, when I put it that way, I think, well, why would any dummy not obey God? Because we get pressure all the time. I know I get pressure all the time. And we have to say, you know what? This is a spiritual battle. Amen? I'm going to have the worship team come up. And as they come up, I'm going to look at one last verse here at the end of Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 28. And it says, And one of the sons of Joadiah, the son of uh, Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law to Sanballat. Therefore I drove him from me. Think about this. You wonder why Nehemiah had such a hard time? Who, do you remember Tobiah? And who was his other guy that was a bad guy? Sanballat. Sanballat was a son-in-law to the priest of Jerusalem. You know what? See, isn't it amazing? The world is always trying to come in and find a way. The world is always trying to find a way. And it takes someone with courage, someone with passion, someone with vision that says, not on my watch. It may not be. Do you think everybody thought, cheered Nehemiah when he threw these guys out? No. Because sometimes we've allowed the world to come in. We don't even know that it is the world sometimes. We just think that's just the way life is. And God says, no, Jesus says, I went to the cross so you could experience an abundant life not just the life the way it is. The high priest's son had allowed Israel's number one enemy a place of fellowship within the city limits of Jerusalem. You wonder why there wasn't praise going on in the city? 
because the enemy had made camp right there. You know what? It's time for you and I to throw the enemy out of our lives, so to speak, and say, you know what? No more, Mr. Devil. My pre your presence was fashioned here for me and I for them. Amen? We as Christians can't be mean and nasty. But you know what the Bible says we must be? We must be separated and different from this world. We can't fellowship with people that don't believe in our same vision. Do you understand that? You can't run around with unbelievers thinking that's not going to affect your life. You can't run around with people and say, you know what, I don't think Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. You know, and they'll say, you know, if God is a God of love, then he won't send it. And do you understand all these things that get bombarded on you? You and I can't run around with people like that because it will affect us. It will affect us. But you know what I do know? You know what, maybe we're going in different directions. Like maybe you got the Baptists and you got, you know, the Methodists and you got the Lutherans and there's good people in every church. There are good people that love Jesus. And maybe their choir is going a different way on the wall. But as long as they're pointing to Jesus, I'm okay. They don't have to believe exactly like I believe. But as long as they're going to say, I know Jesus is the only way and the truth and the life. You know what? We can, we can fuss about things here and things there. I'm okay with that in life. As long as you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Let your choir sing. Hallelujah. I'll sing too. Hallelujah. But we're going to sing together to let people see that it's Jesus. Amen. Why don't we stand up? You know, I hope you've had fun and learned a lot of things through Nehemiah. I don't know about you, but Nehemiah has been a lot more convicting to me than I thought he was going to be. I'm being honest with you. Nehemiah, you know, it's amazing in life. You guys hear this sermon on Sunday. I've had this several times already this week, okay? And so I know when to lift up my toes, you know, when they're coming to step on them. And maybe you didn't get that today and you got your toes stepped on. You know, it doesn't mean that my toes haven't been stepped on. They've been stepped on multiple times, okay? I just know on Sunday when to lift my feet up. Hallelujah, okay? So to speak. But I want you to know, see, Jesus isn't here just to step on your toes. He's here to bless your life. And so, you know what? You just bow your heads and close your eyes. Is there maybe some decisions you've got to make in your life about being separated? See, God isn't calling you to be separated just for separation's sake. He's calling you to be separated unto Him. Because when you and I are separated unto Him, then we can lead other people into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about for me. I want to help people get close to the Savior. And there's always trials and tribulations. There's always the tentacles of the devil trying to pull us away. But we need to say, nope, Mr. Devil, we're going to stay on this straight. And we're not going to give the devil a place to come in and live in Jerusalem in our lives. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this group of people this morning here at Christ the King. Those watching via internet, Lord God, I thank you that your word is strong in our life. Your word is directing our lives, Lord God. Your Lord is showing us the way of salvation, and we say thank you for that. And Lord, help us be compassionate. Help us, Lord God, to be strong. Help us be caring to help other people know the way of Jesus. I thank you and I praise for this. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's open the Christmas season up with joy to the world.
didn't think our neighbors could hear us singing that song. I want to tell you, thank you for that. Would you put your hands up towards heaven as I get ready to bless you? And I just want to encourage you, if you'd like to come back tonight at 6.30 for our, our starting off our Advent season, you know, we're more than welcome to have you here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, I want you to know God is for you and not against you. And before you leave, I want to let you know this, that you, we have so far, we were able to help 48 kids with our Christmas shoe boxes. And we had eight of that. So we've been able to help 56 kids uh, this Christmas just to start right now. And I want to tell you all, thank you so very much to help 56 kids have a brighter Christmas. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen. Oh, I'll get that. Yeah, well, I, I guess back there, look at Doug. Uh, the ladies on Thursday, they have a, a prayer group here, and, and it's the prodigals. And if you have any prayer requests that you'd like for the ladies to pray, put it in the little shoebox right, or the shoe box right there. And your names, you don't even have to have names on it. Put it in there. We just believe in the power of prayer. Amen? God bless. Thank you.